Yeah, welcome, everyone. So just wanted to talk a little bit on uh, what I may have alluded to a little bit in the keynote, but how we're using social annotation to help students in their comprehension and engagement in scientific literature, and also how it also um, developed professional identity formation in our students. All right, making sure that I am able to progress my slides. There we go. Excellent. So as the instructors, we can recognize that the primary research literature is vital for becoming continuous learners once we reach that uh, top level of our expertise. It's necessary for staying current in our field, whether it's, again, in the STEM field or the social sciences, uh, and also for students that are interested in possibly getting involved in research or taking the observations they make in their practice and turning those into actionable investigations, this can also provide some insight in how students can take the methods in the primary research literature and apply them to their own investigations. So, uh, definitely a great uh, experience for students to get involved in, to see what research is about and how it can apply to what they do. We also know that in addition to staying on top of their field, uh, being involved in the primary research literature also enhances student ability to uh, use empirical evidence and critical thinking as they uh, deal with these wicked problems in the real world and trying to determine what the best solution going forward in any uh, particular challenge they run into. We've also seen in some previous studies that inquiry and content mastery were two major components to the student experience in boosting their science identity, their identity that they are a scientist and they are making um, measurable contributions to the field. And again, uh, giving students a pipeline or a gateway into research and starting their own investigations. So you can also use the research literature if you are uh, one of these uh, research universities, be able to showcase opportunities for students to get involved in research if the paper that they are reading is research that's going on just above them in the lecture hall. Now, the challenge with introducing students to that primary research literature is first and foremost, it is not made for students. It's made for other content experts that are engaging in this cutting edge scholarly conversation. So you find the research paper is just full of complex jargon, methodologies that we just do not have the word count to fully explain. And that can result in even students that are very intelligent, very motivated, spending an inordinate amount of time trying to read that paper from cover to cover. Because when you are a content novice and you are reading a research paper, everything looks equally important. And for a very dense research paper, that hyper focus on each and individual part of the paper you can spend eight hours reading that paper from cover to cover, but if you don't have any sort of guidance in what the impact or the novelty of the paper, and you're able to condense that eight-hour reading into a few key points, that makes it very difficult for content novices to be able to retain the information they just read in the paper. So a lot of the times in my undergraduate and even early graduate years, I felt very much like the person in the comic on the lower left here, where I can spend a paper uh, reading all day and still not really grasp the full impact of that paper. And one of the solutions to introduce students into the research literature is through hands-on undergraduate research experience, but even those opportunities can be very limited. A lot of undergrad research opportunities are reserved for capstone projects or upperclassmen that have finished maybe their first two years of courses to really get a foundation of understanding. So these experiences are not available to every student that walks through the door. And the students that have trouble accessing undergraduate research experience are disproportionately our underserved students, our first gen, our underrepresented minority students, 
that may not know the hidden curriculum and the channels in order to get into an undergraduate research experience. So this leaves the course uh, as a potential platform for introducing students to primary research literature and therefore a uh, stepping stone into these research opportunities. But the problem with uh, these in-class journal clubs, especially if it's a class of undergraduates, is that it's hard to engage these content novices with, again, these very dense research papers. You could, for example, uh, use a discussion board, which is one of the uh, traditional means of engaging students in a pre-reading that will happen before like a journal club discussion. And the problem with that is that if you give students a general prompt to find a figure and interpret that figure, then students are going to uh, flood to what they perceive is going to be the easiest figure, not really get the whole scope of the paper that's necessary. And that can result in a lot of um, a lot of agreement floods where one student may provide a really great answer to that figure. And then the following replies are, I agree with so and so that said this. And that provides very little evidence of comprehension in that discussion board. And then when we go to the in-person journal club, the experience can also be very painful if we don't have uh, proper planning going into that journal club, where if you cold call out the students and say, hey, I need you to uh, provide an answer to this question that you might have read in that eight hour reading that you did, but you didn't realize the impact of that question. Therefore, it wasn't really at the forefront of your memory. That is going to provide a very uh, psychologically uh, challenging environment for students where they're not going to feel very motivated to answer those prompts. And that makes a lot of undergrad journal clubs very painful because most of the instructor prompts are met with silence. Uh, each class, there's probably at least two or three students that are very motivated about research already, that regardless of what you do, they'll get excited about a research paper and they will typically contribute the majority, if not all of that journal club discussion. So a very limited uh, fraction of the course is engaged in that journal club discussion. And that end result could have the exact opposite of what was intended. Instead of getting students excited about research, students may leave that experience feeling frustrated or intimidated by engaging in that research. So now that I talked all about the problems, let's talk about some solutions. So uh, we're going to go over an example of a socially annotated research journal that I have for my students. So you can either uh, throw the QR code, and if you have a social annotation, um, if you have a hypothesis account, then you'll be able to go right into a public Canvas page. If you don't, don't worry. It only takes uh, two pages to make if you just put your name and email on. And I will also put the link to that page in the chat. So that way everyone will have access. Oh, here we are. So I'm just going to copy the link address and then put that right here in the chat for everyone. All right, and once you uh, log into that Canvas page, you'll be able to see the example social annotation cancer research literacy assignment right up there if you want to follow along. But while we are setting up, I'll go ahead and just explain a little bit about what's going on on that page. So instead of just throwing the research paper on hypothesis and saying, students go read the research paper and annotate as you see fit, engage with each other, that's all well and good. But I really wanted to provide students with some sort of content expert guidance through that research paper that's going to help them be able to recognize those points of impact and close the knowledge gap just enough 
so that students will be able to fill the gap using their own experience. So that's first off what we're trying to do with the seated annotations is sort of what we see in that left diagram there. We're just trying to get students to close the gap enough that they can apply their knowledge and progress with their understanding of the paper. So you'll see on the example that we'll go into momentarily that, again, I will annotate uh, for those points of interest. I might have them uh, think about some of the background information that is necessary to continue with the paper. I might have students look into one of the methodologies to get a better understanding, or I might have students interpret a figure, but I'll try to provide them some additional guidance on what to look for or what exactly the sub-hypothesis the researchers are trying to ask with that figure. And you'll also notice is that in those seated annotations, I'll uh, put a limited number of respondents. So this was another key feature here to prevent the flood of I agrees from students that just want to find the easiest annotation that they can answer. Instead, I'll put a maximum number of respondents, usually one or two, no more than three max respondents to a seated annotation. And I'll task students for each of these pre-readings to answer one of the annotations, one of the assessment questions that has not already been answered by the maximum number of respondents. And in addition to answering the expert guided assessment that I put into the paper, I also task students with two more objectives, and that is going to be to post their own question on the murkiest point in the paper and also answer a peer's question. So in doing so, I'm really trying to model what that ideal journal club situation is, where again, we not only have a facilitator that is guiding the discussion with those seated assessment questions, but we also have the students exchanging ideas with each other, being able to recognize what those murkiest points are. And then for the students that do have some kind of expertise on the topic, especially those students that may be uh, socially anxious or uh, disabled or otherwise having a hard time engaging in a synchronous in-person discussion, this is a point where they really shine, where they are able to share that expertise in a way that is not as intimidating because we are asynchronous in this uh, shared social annotation platform. So uh, again, we're going to uh, go through that example paper momentarily, but just a few landmarks that I wanna point out that helped me out when I formed these assignments is first off, make sure that your assignment page is uh, very transparent to students. So picking a research paper at your institution will also give you bonus points if you are able to show students research that is going on at your institution, research that students could potentially get involved in if it is something that they're uh, interested in by the end of the course. And once they, uh, once they come in contact with that lead researcher, that principal investigator, they already have one of their uh, very well-known papers uh, familiar to the student, and they can start talking about their research much uh, earlier on in that conversation. Another thing that I like to do is include uh, some very diverse research teams in the papers that I show and include a headshot of some of the key researchers on that team. This is just another way to show the inclusiveness of research if students see that research isn't all just a whole bunch of old white guys, but people that look like them, people that are part of their communities, then that can alleviate some of that anxiety that students have about entering into research. And you'll also find on that assignment page that I'm a big proponent of tilt or transparency in learning and teaching, where for each of these assignments, I'll make it very explicit what the purpose of reading this paper is, what the task I, I expect students to do in order to complete the assignment and the criteria that they are being graded on. So you'll also see on that assignment page that I'll put more weight towards students answer to the assessment 
but also still give 20% uh, each towards posting their own question and answering a peer's question for each of these journal pre-readings. And again, you can look at uh, the assignment page yourself, but this is just another example of what that social annotation page will look like to the students, where I'll put a seated annotation with a maximum number of respondents, and you can also tag your assessment questions with a hashtag assessment to make it easier for students to figure out what are the assessment annotations, how many of them have already been answered by the maximum number of respondents, and then move on to the next piece. Uh, again, you'll see in a moment that uh, this particular assessment may be just a little bit outdated since I like to employ a bit more causal mechanistic reasoning to my assessment design now. But you'll also find that we have an interaction between students here where one student had a question where they might have been a little bit confused about what the relationship was between the bone marrow and the macrophage immune cells. And then another student that had some expertise on the topic was able to reply and provide them with a bit of clarification that, hey, the macrophages are generated from the bone marrow cells, not vice versa. So this is an, another example of what that social annotation interaction is between both the instructor and the students, as well as student-to-student -student peer collaboration. And then the second stage is that in-person journal club. And here what I'm able to do is that as I am presenting the slides, I also have the annotated paper up and I'm able to use that as a guide for being an instructor on who I should be warm calling into the discussion. So if I'm on a particular page, um, I can then warm call students to share their expertise based off of what they put in the social annotator. And I can go on and on about uh, what it is like to be in the classroom, but instead, I think it might be better if you just see for yourself. If I can play this. Now, we also looked into our cyber green assays in order to determine the thermal stability of this drug. So Isaac, you actually posted a pretty interesting video from Thermo about how CyberGreen works. Uh, but can you give us a little bit of a synopsis again of how we're able to determine our thermal stability in this figure? Yeah, so basically <coughs> what the, the green-like substance that they put into, that they put the RNA in, it basically is supposed to measure the radioactivity of what we beam to the RNA molecules because, you know, the more radioactive uh, nucleic acid gets, whether DNA or RNA, especially in double helix, it usually denatures and falls apart. So it's kind of measuring with that SYBR green, how mm -hmm. much it's absorbed. It's also correlating with how much of the, how much the RNA is withstanding the annealing. Right, right, right. So uh, uh, perfect, uh, but uh, Gabrielle, anything to add on to that real quick? Um, no, I think you did a really great job at providing that video. Um, but the only thing I kind of had a question on was, does this graph mean that uh, the 4WJ was able to, um, what was it, like, not degrade at higher temperatures. Like I was just a little confused with the graph because the temperature starts higher on the left side and then mm -hmm. lower on the other. So that means, I'm just wanting to know that I was reading it right. No, 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 excellent question. Excellent. So I did get a, both students permission to share that video. And I thought I would have to comb through like hours of like these uh, recorded lectures that we did, but I actually found this within about the first two minutes of uh, the first video I brought up. So this is not an isolated incident, but some of the things that you might have observed in that interaction is that first off, I'm able to warm call students into the conversation. I started off with Isaac because uh, he had a really great explanation for the particular assay that we were talking about with the cyber green. 
And not only did he reply back with an excellent explanation, but he was also able to reply back with a video explanation, taking one of the uh, videos that Thermo Fisher had on the particular assay, and then provide his own insights on what the researchers did with it. So that was another interesting feature there. And Gabrielle also replied to that same annotation. So it did have a max of two respondents. But what you might not have noticed is that Gabrielle was actually calling in from Zoom. That's why we had this uh, recording already, where we were able to have both an in-person and a Zoom synchronous hybrid journal club and be able to facilitate a pretty good discussion. And Gabrielle was able to share a little bit about her confusion of the graph as well. And we were able to then puzzle piece that together, identify some of the murky points in the paper that as a content expert, I might not have realized that was something that students would get hung up on. And I was able to adjust my lecture accordingly to make sure that we alleviated that misconception. And by warm calling Isaac into the conversation and saying that he had a really great explanation for this assay, that provides a lot more psychological safety for, uh, for example, introverted uh, students that if we were cold calling and saying, hey, uh, Dan, I need you to provide like this uh, answer to this question. You might have read it, but you didn't realize it was important at the time and you're having trouble remembering everything and it's already been a couple minutes and everyone's looking at you. I need an answer now. That can be a very stressful situation that discourages students from engaging in the future. But in doing so, I'm able to go down the list essentially of all the annotations that students have provided as we go through the paper and get 100% class engagement as we put all these pieces together. And this is again, another example of what's called the jigsaw pedagogy, where each of the students is focusing on one aspect of the reading or a concept. And then we're using the in-person, the synchronous time together to get all those pieces and put it into a succinct explanation and a succinct story. So that's really what we're trying to do here is model what we believe is what a professional journal club should be like, where there is this free exchange of ideas and interpretation of the literature. But you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, we have had a couple of different uh, outside reviewers sit on these courses and provide their feedback. And as we're starting to get uh, more of these reviewers, we are starting to notice a couple of themes in their responses. First off, that again, these courses do have students that are demonstrating excellent knowledge of both the experimental techniques and the significance of the results, just with a little bit of guidance from the instructor on what to think on, what to look into, or what to look into uh, as we approach this figure, or maybe see what this uh, methodology is about and how the researchers are using it. Those kind of guided questions are letting students know what the expectation is as they are reading this research literature, and they're coming out with a stronger engagement in those in-person journal clubs. And again, uh, another main theme is that the students are attentive, they are responsive to each of our prompts because we're warm calling them into the conversation. But even what was uh, more impressive is that these students are primarily under underclassmen, undergraduates. So we're talking about these research survey courses that are made to introduce students to research early on that are primarily freshmen, sophomores, very few junior, juniors and seniors in the class. So even with students that may be taking their uh, Bio 101 or their Chem 101 courses, they still have enough understanding that with a little bit of guidance, they can get some really great engagement, some really great understanding of these cutting edge research papers. So what we also wanted to understand, not just how was the student engagement in those in-person journal clubs, but what was the level of comprehension that students were showing when they uh, answer those assessment questions? So we looked at our previous offerings of these courses, where again, we used the traditional uh, discussion board method. 
and compare that to the annotation uh, replies that we were getting from the hypothesis-led journal clubs. And we created an expert, um, an expert validated rubric to get a sense of what are the expectations for a below underclassmen understanding, an average underclassmen understanding, where they might have provided a one to two sentence answer that's mostly correct without very little elaboration. They may have just fetched the answer from the paper almost for verbatim to the average upperclassmen, where uh, there's going to be, again, a very full, correct answer to the prompt. And then what we think that is really the uh, main marker for a graduate level understanding is that the expectation there is that we would expect graduate students to be able to look into outside resources to validate their understanding of a concept. And finally, we had a few students that even gave out answers that really synchronized or really synthesized multiple sources together and provided some of their own unique insights or referred research into that answer that we would really expect to be more of a postdoctoral level. And on average, we did see a significant increase in the student comprehension based off of this rubric. And when we break down the student's average score over the over the uh, length of the course, we found that in the discussion boards, we might have had about 5% of the class have a graduate level understanding throughout the course. So it might be those two or three students that, again, are already highly motivated. You could throw a piece of raw meat at them and they'll get all excited about it. But for the students that may have needed a little bit more guidance, we were able to, with the social annotation, be able to get over a uh, fourfold increase in that graduate level comprehension and also a pool of people that were previously in the underclassmen uh, range of understanding to at least an upperclassmen understanding, even though the class was primarily freshman and sophomore. So when we then uh, surveyed the students on their perspective of a hypothesis and the social annotator, we found that there was no disagreement with the statement that compared to reading research articles on their own, the social annotation strategy used in the course gave them a better understanding of the research literature. And when we had students then explain why they disagreed or agreed, the majority of the students reply that the exchange of information with their peers helped them better understand the paper. So there was that peer-led collaboration. And also, again, the expert guidance on the focus points, the breaking down of the article into sizable chunks. So having, again, that expert guidance, pointing out areas of the paper to get focus on, being able to scaffold that content-dense paper, um, and then also being able to, again, uh, be have a little bit of positive peer pressure was another surprising uh, was another surprising fact there. Where after I maybe praised Isaac for his really great uh, answer on the social annotation, then maybe Brittany also felt motivated to up her game and then provide a really uh, graduate postdoctoral level answer to the next assessment. And really the only negative or the only neither agree or disagree uh, explanations that we got from students is that they felt like they had to teach themselves how to uh, learn the methodology or how to uh, learn the background behind the research rather than kind of being spoon fed the information, which in all honesty, I am not very motivated to change that person's mind because this is absolutely what the expectation is for engaging in the research literature is that there is a lot of uh, in parallel reading where you need to be able to find out how that methodology is used, what some of the background uh, literature is behind that scholarly conversation, that is all a normal part of the investigative process that may be discouraging to students that are used to being spoon-fed information, but I am perfectly fine with them being disillusioned in this case. And then finally, what I may have alluded to a little bit earlier, 
is that it doesn't work if you just have your assessment question posted in the text to uh, interpret this figure or explain this methodology without really giving students any kind of guidance on how it applies to the paper or the underlying phenomenon that you want students to understand. So I found, uh, again, with some colleagues at uh, another conference that this is called uh, causal mechanistic reasoning, this phenomenon of being able to introduce students first to a phenomenon such as uh, Western blotting, for instance, being able to break down the mechanism to, okay, what, how does a Western blot work? What are the components of it? And then linking that into an application of the phenomenon to, okay, so now that the researchers have performed this Western blot and they see this difference between the treatment groups, what is that telling us about the cancer therapy? Being able to format your assessments in such a way where, again, you are introducing students to concept X, how it applies to Y in the paper, that is a potential driver for student comprehension in the seated annotation. So what we wanted to do to investigate that is that for a particularly large uh, survey course that had 40 students, we broke them down into two different groups, group A, group B of about 20 students each. And then for one group, we would give them assessments that are entirely designed with causal mechanistic reasoning. The other group, we would make sure the assessments were devoid of causal mechanistic reasoning. So it might either miss the first part of describe what a Western blot is, or the second part of how did Western blot apply to the question that the researchers were investigating. But both of the groups, we would have a journal club discussion together and regardless of whether the student got causal mechanistic reasoning or no causal mechanistic reasoning, they were able to hear the full story at the end. So just wanted to make that design perfectly clear. And then we also switched which groups were which partway through. And what we found is that first off, it was a little bit more of a mixed bag on whether students thought the causal mechanistic reasoning helped their understanding of the paper, but it was still mostly agreement with very few disagreements. And when we looked at the comprehension between those annotations that were devoid of causal mechanistic reasoning and those that employed causal mechanistic reasoning, we did see a significant jump in the student comprehension, whether or not they were in the early or the late group. And that resulted in, again, a five-fold increase in students that are expressing graduate level knowledge, evidence that they took outside resources to better understand that paper and provide a high quality answer to that assessment question than students that were given assessments that did not have that full causal mechanistic reasoning cycle to it. And then finally, the real finally this time, is that we wanted to see whether or not students, after going through this social annotated paper, had signs of improved uh, measures of persistence in the sciences and including science identity. And we used the experimentally validated but unfortunately acronymed PITS survey, which again is a approximately a six to, actually no, it's about a 42 item uh, survey that, that has a range of questions uh, ranging from uh, project ownership content, whether students felt like while engaging in the literature that they had some kind of ownership in their interpretation of that literature, the project ownership emotion, whether they felt excited or joyful or curious when engaging in the research literature, the self-efficacy, whether they felt that they had the skills to engage in scientific literature, the science identity, which is whether they see themselves as a scientist, scientific community values, whether they feel like they are a part of the scientific community, and finally networking, whether they are not only talking about uh, what they saw in the research literature to their peers, but also whether they're talking about it to their family, their friends, and so forth. And what we found here is that in almost every aspect, 
of persistence in the sciences, we saw improvement in students that have finished the course with social annotation as opposed to when they started out in the course before social annotation. And we are still gathering the last bit of data on the different subpopulations of students. Again, we're particularly interested in whether this was an equitable teaching tool. And what we found so far is that in our BIPOC students, our Black, Indigenous, People of Color students, is that we did see an equitable closing of the persistence gap in the self-efficacy. So our students of color feel that they now have the skills uh, more so than uh, more so than when they first started out in the course, where they might have had a bit of an opportunity gap compared to their white peers, as well as the first generation students saw equitable increases in both the self-efficacy and the science identity, where our first generation students who may come in uh, with some misgivings on whether they belong in the sciences, whether they see themselves in the sciences, after going through the social annotation experience, they are coming out with the same levels of self-efficacy and science identity as their continuous gen peers. So what can we take from this experience so far? Is that first off, uh, when I am annotating these assessments, I'm going to again do it in parallel to designing my slides because I want to make sure that as I am going through the slides and I find a discussion point that I want to emphasize in the in-person journal club, I want to then be able to have a student lead that discussion. So I will often make my assessments while I'm making my slides, and that saves me a lot of time. I don't have to go back and forth and reflect on what are the assessment questions I want to put into this paper if I think about what I want to discuss in the in-person lecture. And again, making sure the assessments only have one or two maximum respondents. And again, when you uh, are forming those assessment questions, do try to leverage causal mechanistic reasoning in the design to better facilitate student learning and comprehension of the research. So again, describing the phenomenon and how the researchers use it to determine why is going to better facilitate comprehension than of generic co compare these figures or describe this figure or this method. And again, this is also going to normalize the use of additional outside resources to answer those assessment questions. This is a normal part of the research process that we want students to be aware of going in. And also another thing that I like to do is that I like to block a good half hour to an hour before that in-person journal club to review the student annotations. And again, what that allows me to do is not just be familiar with the really great answers that I want to warm call into the discussion, but also be able to find the murky points in the paper that I should emphasize and clarify for the class that I may not have realized as a content expert what students were getting hung up on. And also having the article on a second device during, during Journal Club is very helpful. I may use, for example, a tablet or a laptop with the social annotated paper up while I'm giving the lectures over, uh, over a PowerPoint projector or something of that nature. And again, that, re that allows me to warm call students into the discussion and praise preemptively. Isaac, you had a really great ex explanation for what the cyber green assay is. Can you share that with the class? That warm call is, again, game changing when it comes to engaging students in the research literature. And this is all part of normalizing questions, clarifications, uncertainties that students in maybe their traditional learning did not get a lot of exposure to. There's always a correct answer that they have to regurgitate out. But really when we're at the cutting edge of research, having students recognize the uncertainty, the subjectivity, the different perspectives in analyzing and interpreting that data, that is all a normal process that they will be new to coming into these research survey courses that we want to emphasize using the social annotation platform. All right, and we have just a few minutes. So if there's any questions in the chat, I'll try to answer them real quick. But if I don't get to your question or if there is 
questions that you want to follow up on, please do feel free to email me at denton.58 at osu.edu. And thank you. All right, and then I see Brittany. Uh, do you tell students at the beginning of the semester about your approach to warm calls during classes? Um, you know what, Bethany? I don't think I'm very explicit about it, but uh, students catch on pretty quickly. I think that if uh, you were the main uh, respondent to an assessment question, you will be expected to share your findings to the class. So I think that is, uh, is, is caught on pretty quickly by the students, even if I don't explicitly point it out. All right, I think we are again at time, but again, do feel free to email me, denton.58 at OSU with any questions you have.